Welcome to this afternoon exciting session. I, I got to tell you guys, whenever I meet with this group of uh, uh, doctors next to me and whenever meeting, I learn a lot just by side conversation. And I think it's a great idea from uh, uh, Manos and his team to put on this session. So this session, I'm looking forward to it. It's very, very exciting. And you're going to learn and see some few tricks you're probably not going to find in in papers, or they're gonna, you're going to find them in papers in five years. First, I'm going to introduce my panel. Uh, for, I am uh, Khaldun Alswad. I'm uh, from uh, Detroit, Henry Ford Hospital. To my left uh, is actually my co-fellow. Uh, we train together. We are tortured uh, auctioner graduates. Uh, Salman Arain. Uh, uh, to his left, uh, my good friend uh, Farooq Jafar. I wish I have 10% of his IQ, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm making do whatever I have. And um, uh, Thomas Kathleen uh, uh, to his left. And um, we, we saw him, Jim. And uh, Ashish is not here. Um, uh, Tony doing. And we saw him, Jabber. We saw him, Jabber. All right. I, I read your name so many times, but I never put face to name. I kind of seen you, so welcome. So uh, with uh, no further ado, we're going to start with uh, Tony doing. He's going to talk about STAR technique. Very, very exciting uh, technique. It's actually very good for bailout. And uh, uh, we're going to show uh, uh, how to use it. Hi, I'm Tony doing. I'm up the road here in Fort Collins about 45 minutes. Uh, and let me please say uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's quite an honor to be here. Um, we've been in the uh, Progress CTO registry for about five years now. And so we're all familiar, of course, with the hybrid algorithm. And what we'll talk about today, if I can get a little pointer here, is in, you know, the hybrid algorithm, you're deciding integrate, retrograde, and then you decide dissection, reentry versus wiring. And if you look Carefully, if you can read it, if the print is big enough, today we're going to discuss the wire based reentry. Of course, everybody's very familiar with the controlled reentry of a stingray catheter and all the you know, positive benefits for using that. And the hybrid algorithm has had a great success rate of 88%, although you could still make an argument that says, you know, there that means 12% of people we will not have a successful case. And so if there are any tidbits and tricks to be used, it would be a nice thing. And so here we're going back in time to 2005. This is Antonio Colombo uh, and the STAR technique, which we will discuss the um, technique of it and, and the where, how, and when, but before we do, let's just do the history lesson. The, the problem was the success rate was fairly low for this uncontrolled reentry. Um, the MACE rate was high after the reentry, and the restenosis rate was high down the line, and therefore that, that's why we, it's been supplanted by the hybrid algorithm. Um, in regard to using STAR, if you look in Manos's wonderful textbook, he says, only as last resort, should not be used in the LAD uh, due to loss of septals, diagonals, and the possibility of bypass surgery. And if you talk to Bill, he says, uh, if you're using the STAR, try not to stent. Actually, if this was built, it would all be capitalized. Um, but repeat the angiogram typically shows better outflow uh, and, and more branches. Great for the SIR, great for diags, not so great for the LAD. And I should say, great for the distal right, um, because that's a place where you, you get lucky on these reentries. Um, so these are bailout cases. That, you know, remember, the title of the, is what you learned this year, and you learn things um, sometimes when things don't go very well. Um, you'll see two of the star reentries, and I think really that's the whole thing, isn't exactly about the cases, but just seeing it happen, that I had seen these guys all do stars, and I said, that would be awesome if I could do that. Uh, so generally, we'll be using a, a microcatheter, a fielder XT, um, but you will see one with a different, a gladius wire, it happens. And then um, I think what you're seeing is a, not only a bend in the vessel, but slightly a bend back. The, the stiffer part of the wire just straightens the angle. And then most importantly is watching the knuckled wire tip shrink um, as it makes the reentry back into the true lumen. 
Now, with that being said, both of these are in the LAD, um, which isn't a good idea, but you know what? Things happen, and uh, here we go. Uh, and so please, please uh, learn from what I do, but don't do as I do. And then again, I would say star technique is used uh, better. It's better used without stents. However, uh, you know, what can I say? Things happen. And so here we go. An occluded LED with an ambiguous cap, reasonable collaterals, a pretty good landing zone. Uh, this is just the still picture of it. We made an attempt at a reverse cart, and I was unable to get that, but I was able to start driving some equipment forward with the idea I'm going to move the, the, uh, the working zone just down past the uh, site where we just beat it up, try to get a cross boss out here, and then I'll get a stingray. And so, funny thing happened with the cross boss. You'll see this a lot in the right corner area that it's kind of a straight catheter and it will find branches on you. And if you look carefully here, what we have is a perf going. Uh, just a stain though, so it's really not hemodynamically significant. The patient's doing okay. Um, and so they, my thought was I wasn't stopping the case. I'm going to move my base of operations slightly more distal. And so I have a knuckled wire out here. And uh, here, this was really, to the honest truth, is this was sort of a happy accident. But the nice thing is you get to see how a star works. And so here it comes. You'll see a big knuckle, big knuckle, shrink right when you come around that curve. And I think what you have is the stiffer body of the wire just kind of jams it through the, um, out of the false lumen and out of the subluminal space into the true lumen. And so there is still work to do on this case. Um, I ha if Bill was there, he would have said, doing, don't stent it. Um, but I sort of had this idea that, well, that diag has a perf in it anyway. I was moving my base operations distal to it anyway, and I went ahead and just stented it. But you could probably say a critique, it would have been a perfect case had I just only ballooned it, left it for later, brought him back in a few weeks and see how it was. As it was, we checked a few echoes. There was no evidence of pericardial fusion, and the patient did well. Perfect. So here we go. Uh, these are always a wonderful case. A lady, wonderful lady, about my height, but weighing in about 310 pounds, had multivessel disease everywhere. Uh, one of my partners did her right. She lived three, four hours away, so she came down. So there's a little pressure on me to get everything done today. And so I had started with, although I used ultrasound and I used a micropuncture kit, I ended up with a low stick. But I being the very patient cardiologist that I am, I pulled the equipment, we waited for 10 minutes, and then uh, we went ahead and started the case. And so we get going, I, I stent the circ, I come back around, I'll show you the pre-shot for the LAD. You can see there's disease up in the mid and proximal LAD, and this, uh, as far as CTOs go, this isn't a whole lot of fun. That the, um, if you are going to make a re-entry, it's going to be down here. So you really, you're hoping you can somehow get a wire into this. As far as um, collaterals that are interventional collaterals, there don't, does not appear to be a lot of them. But while we're working, um, the, the nurse astutely turns to me and says, you yeah, know, her leg is swelling up. What's happening here? And I naturally say, oh, it's just a big leg. Don't worry about it. It's fine. But it turns out there's a big bleed going. Uh, the wiring didn't work. I have a stingray way down there, and it's not working either. And so you can see I'm doing a straw technique here. So I'm drawing blood out to try to get rid of the hematoma to try to make this re-entry. Uh, but things are going a little sideways. And so I thought, well, we got to try something different. And I didn't think retrograde was a great option through that epicardial collateral. And so here comes a star on purpose. We have a Corsair. We have a Filter XT. You can see a big uh, knuckled wire, and you can see it shrink. 
and and what you're, the the location is important. That this is a, a tortuous part of the LED, and again, you're taking a fairly stiff wire. Now, I remember getting yelled at from the last time, and I tried not to stamp, but really, I had no flow anywhere. And so, here we go again. You, you could have made an argument that says, well, you could have came back with the Angie sculpt, and I think I, I, I skipped that. But I think it, at the end of the day, we ended up with a not a perfect, but a pretty good result. We had the right open, we had the circ open, and uh, she did well. And so I would say this star technique, you know, when a controlled reentry is not possible, it can be helpful. And I think it's important to watch for the quote unquote shrinkage of the. Uh, the knuckle tip of the wire. Uh, generally, try not to stent due to loss of branches and high resinosis rate, but maybe can be done uh, with a, uh, it, avoiding a full metal jacket. You could try angiosculpt, try not to use it in the LED. Uh, but I do think before an investment procedure gets done, this is a reasonable step. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just a couple of questions. We still have two minutes for discussion. So, uh, 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 the panel, what, any thoughts or questions for Tony? I, I just had a comment. Uh, great cases. I was going to tell you, you know, the, but the star, the thing is, to stent or not to stent depends on how many branches you're going to shut off. And I think both of your cases were relatively short stars. So I would say that you did the right thing. I probably would have done the same thing. And what I would say is if you have time, if the groin isn't bleeding, once you've starred and angioplastied, don't take an injection but use IVUS. And if this segment that's actually within the star is relatively short and you're not losing any major septals or diags, you're fine. So if you're in the mid-distal LED, I think it's okay to stent. T Tony, uh, I have a question for you. So which wires? And how much you push? Uh, the first one was a Gladius, and I was sort of pushing medium hard, yeah. and I just saw it shrink. And I had seen you guys okay. do this before, and I saw it shrink, and I said, hello, and, and I just got it down. The second time, I pushed it a little harder. That was like medium hard, but it wasn't hard hard. Was it was it medium Gladius hard. Too? No, that was a XT. XT. So what do you guys think? Uh, how many of you use um, uh, STAR technique um, in the peripheral. Anybody used it in the SFA? So those who did peripheral in a long time, that was very, very familiar technique. You just moved it to the coronary. And there are a few pitfalls. And uh, what do you think, uh, uh, Nick, about stenting or not stenting after a star? Well, you know, I, I think that they hit the nail on the head and it really has to do with the length of the stent. Uh -huh. You know, we're in the subintimal space a lot when we're in a CTO. We don't really have any idea where the hell we are most of the time during a CTO. So I don't think it's the, the actual um, fact that it's a subintimal for such a long thing. It's just a really long uh, segment and a lot of times with the star because it doesn't have side branches you don't have good as good a flow through that so that's going to increase your restenosis rate as well and I think the point that was made about making if it's a very short segment th that's perfectly appropriate to stent but if it's the whole vessel particularly the LAD and you know the person's stable you should leave it alone and come back absolutely so uh, the next speaker is, is going to be uh, Wasim Jabber and he's gonna. Uh, I'm looking forward to his uh, to his presentation, entrapment of a microcatheter. So let's see what happened. Good afternoon. Uh, we thank sound you for the, Sorry. No problem. Thank you for okay. the opportunity. I don't have any fancy uh, case to present. Uh, any fancy new technique, but a case. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, in my mind, the best lessons that we learn happen when we are faced with um, some troubles and we try to reflect back and see what, what we did wrong and how to avoid it next time. And in that line, I'll, I'll uh, discuss a case where we got a stock retrograde microcatheter. This is a 63-year-old man with diabetes, hypertension, risk factors, a lot of angina, had an inferior ischemia on stress test on multi-anginals, multi multiple anti-anginals. On Kathy, had moderate disease in the LAD, totally occluded RCA, and he was referred to me for PCI of the RCA. This is a simultaneous injection, right and left. You can clearly appreciate all the calcium in the right coronary artery. 
uh, occlusion and the diffuse disease in the left anterior descending. And based on the hybrid algorithm here, based, this lesion seems to be a lesion where you would, uh, would want to try with uh, any grade one escalation. Tried that first, didn't go too far because of probably severe calcification and also the RV branch there that was, that was trying to suck my wire into it. So decided to go retrograde. This is, this is the LED here and notice all the diffuse disease and calcification in it. Multiple septals, uh, wired several initially, uh, surfed them, but eventually I was able to cross only through that distal septal. The wire went up went up to the distal lesion, and I had a hard time advancing that microcatheter up to the distal cap. Once it got there, advanced the knuckle wire, but then um, my uh, microcatheter was, was stuck. I was unable to pull it back. I felt some fatigue in the wire. I wanted to pull it back, was unable to, and then I was unable to advance it either. So the options here are steps. First, you pull a little hard, doesn't work. Then another option is to do any grade dissection, which we did, and balloon to soften the calcium plaque where the, where the microcatheter is stuck, and then try to pull harder. That didn't work either, and the patient was starting to have ST elevations and hemodynamic instability related to the flow in this LED. So that's mostly related to the bad LED disease, and in that respect, some of the difficulties pulling the catheter are related to that calcified and tortuous LED having crossed through all that diffuse disease. You go back here, see where we crossed, which septal had to cross all the uh, diffuse LED disease. So the first step in this case is to wire the LED to maintain, to maintain access to it, and then decided to, to uncouple the disease in the LED from the microcatheter by advancing a guide extension catheter over both my anti-grade wire and the retrograde microcatheter. So what we did is cut the microcatheter proximally, then advance the guide extension catheter down over it. And how this helped is that prevented the LED from accordioning once that um, extension catheter was down to the septal. And so pulling hard, that was stable, we were able to pull the catheter, then stented the LED. Now I stopped here and I brought the patient back, but now I learned some lessons from this case. One is treat the donor vessel first, which we did. Also, when we have diffuse disease on the other side, try the septal proximal to mid-LED disease. I did not spend enough time before trying to wire that first septal. Or try the section re-entry, another method. Also change microcatheter as soon as you notice fatigue. And when there's severe calcification, try, if possible, to dissect outside the calcium, before or after the calcium. And this is what we did here. Notice that the microcatheter now is in the proximal septal, going down into the posterior lateral. We did traditional reverse cart. Tried to dissect far from the calcium here, both distally and proximally, and we ended up fixing this vessel. Thank you very much. Great case. Thank you so much for um, showing us uh, this case. And obviously, you kind of summarized um, the lesson. Would, would a different microcatheter uh, be uh, like reacted or interacted differently <laughs> with, the, with the LED? It's possible. Uh, I believe this microcatheter I was using was a turnpike, and maybe a, a lower profile microcatheter might have been, might have been different. Uh, turnpike LP maybe would have been better, or a, or a caravel, or maybe sometimes fine cross. Maybe less friction in the left anterior descending, which was the main problem. So I have a question. The other question I have, because I've had this entrapment so many times, and I thought it is actually the microcatheter is entrapped and I discover is actually the wire. It's not the, the, the catheter, the microcatheter locked on the wire. Because when I tried to pull the wire, the wire would not come out so easily and I had really to push, to pull really hard to get it and I end up like putting um, uh, rotor wire to get the microcatheter out. Did that happen during this case? No, in this case, you're right. Yeah. In this case, although my initial thought was the catheter was trapped in the calcium distally, most of the trapping was more proximal and the wire was, I was able to move yeah. the wire. And in fact, I pushed that knuckle further to be able to pull the catheter down and it wouldn't yeah. work. But I was able to pull the wire. That was not the major problem, although there was some interaction. But that's a good point. We always have to, as soon as we feel any fatigue of the microcatheter on the wire, to try to exchange right away. Anybody so, have any questions from the audience? I have one comment. Um, it's a great, important case, and I think it reinforces that 
your initial move should not be to pull as hard as you can because it is really a dangerous thing that can happen. Do, do, you, do you know for certain if it was the body or the tip or both that was entrapped? I think both, but because we had, if only one wouldn't have been a big issue, uh, but you have to get one of, the, one of them out of the equation and with the guideline or approximately to move the LED out of the equation. So there are two factors working against you in this case. Do you think, and it may, for the whole panel, has anyone ever tried to Carlino at that moment to free up the tip from the, off the calcium? Should have mentioned that, I tried it too in this case, but that's one of the options that, that should be tried. And that, that's a proof that the problem was, was mostly the proximal, uh, the proximal friction. I think, Mike, so the answer is no. And I think the reason is because my experience has been with uh, the you know, Kyle type of uh, entrapment where I think the tip gets frayed and you keep trying, you keep, and especially with the Turnpike LP, and at some point that frayed tip basically entangles the wire. And I think that's what happens, and that's the cases where you have to basically just take out everything. Though I think if you have, based on what you're saying, entrapment and you take the wire out and you can move the wire freely, then I think uh, Carlino is a great idea to straighten out the tip maybe. All right, so we're gonna move on to the Thank next you. speaker, uh, CTOPCI for treating uh, mitral valve regurgitation uh, by my co-moderator, Nick Burke. And um, those who don't know Nick, uh, hold on to your britches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you know, I don't think I deserve this reputation. <laughs> I'm actually not going to do anything Funny? Oh, Fun come on. Yeah, no, you okay. did it earlier today. You killed it. You killed it. You killed it. Um, so, uh, CTO PCI for mitral regurgitation, or I entitled it, it's not just for angina anymore. Um, as I mentioned, or Cal mentioned, I'm from the Minneapolis Heart Institute, and I don't have any relevant disclosures, unfortunately. The patient is a 57 year old uh, man with an interesting uh, past medical history of HIV positivity, and he's had a PE uh, while on Xarelto and was treated with Xarelto. He, he suffered from recurrent episodes of flash pulmonary edema and presented to a different hospital uh, than ours. Uh, on echocardiography, he had normal left ventricular function and mild mitral regurgitation. Um, these are the images uh, of his debutamine uh, stress echocardiogram, which I am assured shows that there's no obvious uh, ischemic defect. At least this is what uh, the echo people told me it shows, and I will believe them. Uh, this, however, is the debutamine stress echo with uh, color flow. Notice I noticed that this was a color flow Doppler uh, study and um, because they told me. And you can see that uh, the mitral regurgitation uh, becomes much worse with uh, debutamine. So uh, the debutamine stress echo showed worsening of mitral regurgitation, and they performed a coronary angiogram. And it showed surprisingly minimal disease in his LAD in the right coronary artery in the circumflex, but a complete uh, or chronic total occlusion of his ramus intermedius. And at that outside hospital, uh, PCI was attempted. Um, but they were unfortunately unsuccessful. So the patient was referred to the MHI Center for Complex Coronary Intervention. Um, so if you look at this uh, angiogram here, you can see the ramus and it looks like it's got a, a nice little channel. So I was chuckling to myself that uh, the prior interventionalist's uh, in, um, investment procedure probably paid off. Um, so you can see it sort of coming in uh, slowly there. So I just went straight in an antegrade uh, with a fielder XTA uh, on a threader, um, assuming I was going to be able to get in pretty easily. Um, pictures later showed not being so sure that I was in, and in fact I wasn't in the true lumen, I was in a dissection. So uh, we attempted the uh, dissection reentry strategy with a stingray. Um, you can see that here, uh, the wires uh, exiting um, in the correct uh, direction, probably continuing on through uh, the other side of the vessel. So it's kind of going through and through, which is why in, this, in most situations, a stick and swap uh, is particularly helpful. 
but I wasn't sure about that. So we ended up needing to try to go retrograde. So I, here I used um, a ping pong technique, um, an XTR and a turnpike uh, LP to go retrograde. Uh, ping pong, as I said, to uh, externalize the wire. The wire, I was able to direct that uh, directly um, and then uh, perform anti-grade PTCA and uh, stents and more balloons uh, were done. And this should be, there you go, after a little angioplasty. Uh, and we decided uh, that this was going to be a satisfactory result. So we sent him back to his referring uh, hospital and uh, a repeat the butamine stress echo. Uh, again, uh, showed no significant ischemia here. And uh, what they assured me was no dramatic worsening of the mitral regurgitation with the debutamine stress echo. I had to trust them on that uh, because I wasn't quite as convinced. So um, I believe that's the first report of mitral regurgitation treated with CTO PCI that, that I'm aware of. I was trying to find some others in the literature. It's obviously an extremely isolated case. It's awesome. Thank you so much. So, so there is no ischemia by stress test, but yet there is ischemic MR. Yes. How do you explain that? Well, it, it depends upon how you define ischemia. And one is wall motion abnormality. There wasn't wall motion abnormality, but there was papillary muscle dysfunction. Okay. So, so actually, <clears throat> it's a debate I often have with my boss, Richard Smalling, who's big into mitroclip. And you get these patients who have MR, and, and they have a CTO in that posterior lateral branch or the OM2, which supplies the papillary muscle, and they have it. And he always wants to do the mitroclip, and obviously he always wins the debate. Um, I think it's exactly that. I think the reason why acute MIs present with angina as opposed to the CTO that present with dyspnea is because Typically, these patients have ischemic diastolic dysfunction, and that's what causes the EDP to go up. If, you, if the ischemia involves a distribution of the posterior papillary muscle, then sometimes, even without wall motion abnormalities, you get a rise in EDP, worsening of MR, and I think that's the mechanism of the difference between the symptomatology of CTOs versus um, acute MIs, and that's why patients, uh, their exercise and exertion capacity improves after uh, ischemic MR. Anybody else has any comments? Well, the false negative rate of a stress echo is not negligible. It's 10%. And so you're going to miss some people on stress echo. I'd say it's more like 25. Yeah, yeah. The, spe <laughs> this, the specificity is very good, but the sensitivity. No, you've got, to go, you've got to go with the clinical. And the guy kept on presenting with recurrent pulmonary edema, which was classic, and they weren't having any trouble diagnosing that. And this was the only uh, reasonable explanation. And since that time, he's not been back in the hospital. You know, I think this is like the Higgs particle. I know it exists. You're the first person to see it, so that's fantastic. <laughs> I think uh, stress MRI sometimes can help you with this because you can actually see ischemia in the pap muscles yeah, or some exactly. scarring in the pap muscles, so that well, could help you go out there. Uh, absolutely. At the end of the day, we're going to have to make a clinical decision according to what we know as physicians. Like a test is, does not replace clinical judgment, absolutely. Uh, now, the next talk uh, is by my friend Farouk Jafar, uh, and he is basically the uh, most eminent expert in CTA, C CT and CTO, and I'm just waiting for him to make our life easier by discovering how to do it and how to couple those two together. Okay, well, well, it's a pleasure just to even be called eminent. That doesn't happen. I'm usually called much worse. <laughs> Um, thanks for letting me be part of this session, and thank you to the organizers for putting this together. Um, this will hopefully be a um, uh, neat example of um, thinking about a case that would otherwise classically be retrograde, but using um, CT guidance in real time to make it an integrate case. My disclosures. Sorry about the buzzing. Okay, so um, this audience definitely knows we cannot see every part of the CTO because we cannot get contrast in the CTO segment. That leads to some abnormalities in terms of what we can interpret on the angiogram. We have trouble with ambiguity at the proximal cap. We have trouble with tortuosity. And sometimes we can't see calcium that well. CT can address a lot of this. If we don't address these questions and really understand them, we can end up with serious complications. So here's a, a, a case because it's a brief report. I won't get into the background of the CT fusion technology too much, but um, we'll move to a case of a gentleman who um, benefited from this um, approach. 
Um, he'd had a recent bypass and had early vein graft failure six months later. He had really, really limiting angina, rest angina, waking him up at night. Um, and he had um, breakthrough angina despite uh, multiple anti-anginals, three, using nitroglycerin every day, almost daily. So a really, really limited person. His diagnostic angiogram, um, we're, um, this is the interventional part of it, but the diagnostic angiogram showed a patent lima, and it showed um, a right coronary that you can see occluded here in the mid-segment. Right here, there's a large RV marginal um, here, and it's really ambiguous about in terms of where the actual entrance to the mid-right coronary um, proximal cap is. The collaterals here are ipsilateral through a bridging collateral, and then retrograde the collateral options are really dominated by a posterior left ventricular branch. The PDA is connected, it does fill. There's not a second CTOA here, but really the filling is mostly through posterior left ventricular branch collaterals to this um, kind of corkscrew epicardial circumflex. So from a uh, pure technical standpoint, we would consider trying um, retrograde through the septals, but we would not be particularly excited to go after those epicardials as a first strategy. If we can convert to an integrate approach, we can really de-risk this case, um, but that's not easy to do with very ambiguous proximal caps. So what about CT? So this is um, um, technology that has been developed to really use pre-procedural CT and geography, which is something we do routinely when we, um, uh, for complex cases. But this goes a step further. It actually extracts the information it takes the center line from the CT angiogram, so we can see in CT the occluded segment, we can see the wall, we can see calcium, and therefore we can actually track the course, for example, of the right coronary. So we segmented the right coronary, and uh, this is worked out in partnership with a very strong radiology uh, collaborator, Brian Koshadra, and my team, um, which has been um, essential in, in making this work. Um, what we can do is segment the, the actual right coronary, um, which you see going right here, and we can segment the um, RV marginal. Now, the segmentation is not perfect, so it is not used completely blindly, but we study these ahead of time. We look at the angle between the main branch and the side branch, and then we really try to map and, and actually fuse this. And we get fairly close most of the time. We have to um, not use this only as our only um, fiducial, but it is actually, uh, in many cases, quite reliable. We will also consider things like running an IVUS catheter ahead of time just to also pre-identify this. And of course, there's real-time IVUS guidance, but sometimes that's hard to do in seven French systems and um, with um, smaller side branches. So um, we use this to basically identify um, the bifurcation and then move forward here. And you'll see um, our first attempts here are trying to use this real-time CT fusion. We feel like we're getting close to the proximal cap. Um, in this, we're just sliding with um, jacketed wires, XTA, fighter, and then ultimately guy 3 and none were able to really engage that proximal cap. So um, um, any suggestions from the panel? I can tell you what we did next, but yeah. we'll make so it a little what, interactive for a second. What, what, what do you uh, uh, think, uh, we, Sam, would like, how would IVIS help you here? IVIS is, is helpful in, in trying to find where the, where the um, artery, main artery is. Usually if you see a big jump in the size of the artery from proximal to the side branch, but it's frequently very difficult. And it, I find it more of something we try to do and, and less frequently helpful. Because usually these vessels are very diseased. There's a lot of calcium and it's hard to tell for sure where the ostium of the vessel is, the occluded vessel is. So let's say, let's say I am not at a, at a center where I have Farouk Jaffer there who can actually do this amazing work in your radiology department. There are several strategies come to my mind to trying to solve that ambiguity of the proximal cap. And we can, we can talk about them, um, including IVIS guided or sometimes just do a side branch base and, and just push a knuckle, but you end up committed to single strategy, which is ADR. Great. So um, um, one, of the, one of the strategies we tried to adopt is we, we realized we kept sliding down that RV marginal branch. We said, let's put a balloon in it and kind of do both a blocking strategy and a, uh, an open sesame type strategy here. So a blocking balloon was placed um, here in the, in, the, in the RV branch. We realigned, and here we started to basically say, okay, now maybe we won't be sliding into this. We can actually deflect. This does take, um, um, to intensify this, does take a leap of faith. We kind of cross-checked based on multiple fiducials on angiography. But ultimately, what we um, um, tried then is to use um, a stiffer wire. We, in fact, used um, a, a Hornet 14 to try to engage this cap 
really feeling very confident that we had nailed the area of the bifurcation and where the proximal cap engaged. And so with that, um, what we um, eventually were, were able to do is to um, engage the proximal cap here. You'll see at the very end, um, the um, uh, Hornet 14 makes it into, an, into a zone. And when we're doing this, we don't actually have the CT overlay right over it because it would be hard to see the device, but we can easily slide it back and forth. We're looking at the angle. It looks like about 30 degrees here. It looks like about 30 degrees here. We're feeling relatively good so far. We would not chase this with a microcatheter, though, without swinging 360 and making sure that we are fully in the anatomical right coronary AV groove. So then, um, to, rather than dealing with a microcatheter approach, we um, continued to try to wire a little bit and for, fortuitously. Um, what happened to the Hornet 14, um, which I don't routinely do or advise, is that it knuckled into what looked like the mid-right coronary. So we said, um, again, let's swing around and look in multiple different views and feel like we have this and it was in the right um, AV groove. We extended the knuckle, confirmed that looks really well matched here to the CT angiogram, and then moved forward with um, anti-grade dissection re-entry, um, as Cal suggested, fielder XT to the bottom, and ultimately a stingray and sw a stick and swap with a pilot 50 um, to allow us to select the distal vessel. Um, this led to successful stenting with preservation of the branches. Wow. So just to conclude, um, um, we avoided, here I can just show that again because it is a nice result. Okay. Um, <laughs> and um, um, the uh, important part here was that we kind of de-risked uh, what would be a complex retrograde case with um, an integrated approach using um, CT guidance. Um, the patient did well. And uh, we still have a lot to learn about CT guidance. It's not necessarily easy and, and useful for every single case, um, but with resolving proximal cap ambiguity, uh, it can potentially um, accelerate um, a, a safe and a great approach. Um, thanks very much. All right. We still have uh, time for discussion. So, so I, I asked one of my CT uh, uh, people in my, uh, to show me. I had a, a branch. I didn't know if it's an OM or a diagonal. And, um, so she did a very sophisticated CT study when I looked at it. It's basically told me, oh, it's definitely a one. But anyway, it turned out to be diagonal. And uh, so <laughs> what, <laughs> what kind of algorithm do you use? How, how do you can determine the, the non-filled part without contrast, the occluded part, right. by the algorithm? Right, so, so you know, this, is, um, this work has been kind of um, pioneered by Siemens in terms of the extraction. So there's a lot of information that goes into segmentation. Uh -huh. um, but there's no question that when we do all of these cases, I sit with our, my colleague Brian, who's a um, spectacular cardiac radiologist, and we review these for about 20 to 30 minutes, and we actually go through um, the CT angiogram and the X-ray angiogram side by side. We spend time looking at both of those branches. I said, show me the branches here. I want to know how many millimeters it is north of the proximal cap, how many millimeters south of the proximal cap. I need to see the fiducials. Uh -huh. And so then we basically you know, feel confident. Then he's also looking at the source images, which is something that I am not really a, a CT axial radiologist, so I definitely need his help for that part. But we go side by side, and we go one by one through those axial reconstructions to make sure that we're in the main body. Mid-right, you know, two, three, 2.5, three millimeter vessels, we usually don't miss those. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So what, what uh, the, the other question, does, does that help you with what your wire choice, the CT? Like, what kind of wire would you start with? Or it's like, meaning, how much can you appreciate the calcium versus no calcium? It, it really helps for calcium. So I think it re really helps me understand how hostile this vessel is and how difficult the dissection is going to be. And so, um, you know, we might move quickly to more Carlino-based techniques to make progress and realize we're getting stuck. You can, you know, someone who's experienced as yourself will know this right away, but for um, planning purposes, it's really nice to know you can underappreciate calcium a lot by fluoroscopy. Any, any other questions? Well, I, I just think that, you know, you, you illustrated a point extremely well. By using this, you resolved some of the ambiguity in that you told us, we, you showed us initially that we couldn't tell where the vessel was going. 
And in those situations, you're limited in your wire choice. You need to follow what the vessel will give you with a real soft wire or maybe at the most a Pilot 200. You're not going to be comfortable using a Hornet 14 or a Confianza Pro 12, which is exactly what was needed to actually pierce this, this cap. And you resolve that ambiguity of saying where the vessel goes. I know the vessel goes in this particular route. It doesn't have a big loop. It doesn't have a shepherd's crook here. It follows where it goes, and I can comfortably go with a warrior wire, which you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. I, I, go ahead. Yeah, so you summed it up perfectly. I mean, we still are careful about not over-relying on this as this technology is still um, disseminating, but there is absolutely no way that I would have taken a Hornet 14 blindly in this case. Do, do you see, Farouk, in, in the horizon, this could be real-time code registration? And how, like, is it what the barriers to that now? Certainly, in the, there, there are ways to accelerate this, and I think there are going to be some, some auto segmentations like the way it happens for TAVR, uh -huh. um, which is very fast and very simple. It's, of course, that's a big, gigantic aorta, so it's a lot easier to segment. But if you don't have to worry about the distal vessels and you just only segment the CTO zone, that can actually accelerate things quite a bit. Cool. What, what about using the esophagus vein graft that's only six months old and coming down and doing a, a retrograde through the esophagus vein graft? Was there any consideration for that? Um, it certainly, it was a, um, a reasonable approach um, as well. If I remember correctly, I think um, his vein graft um, um, was not identified on the CT well. And so one of the criteria that I have um, you know, struggled with with CT, we actually use that, if I don't see any retrofilling of the distal hood, I find it very hard to exit from the vein graft into the actual true PDA. So it's one of the criteria I look at by CT and by fluoroscopy. If it's truly a flush occlusion, it becomes very hard to kind of re-enter there. So, um, um, but it's a, it's a reasonable point. All right, thank you so much. The next speaker is actually me. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to try not to go over time, and uh, that's here. <laughs> yeah, you can time me. All right. I actually have disclosures, and they're going to come in my, uh, in my slides. Uh, so the best lessons I learned on CTO during the past year, and these lessons, literally, I learned from talking to others, okay? Like, when we meet, we over beer and over wine and lots of it, we basically discover each one of us what he or she is doing. So I came uh, to use more Astato and Hornet 14 and Bovi, what we call transcatheter electrosurgery. This is, um, uh, I think she's 55 years old, very diabetic, uh, very poor distal targets, very heavily calcified LED. So this is how the procedure went. We thought it's short occlusion, uh, the, the vessel was actually reconstituted all the way to that chunk of calcium you see there. So I thought, I'm going to go into grade. We put a microcatheter, and this is how it goes. Uh, I already used the Confianza Pro 12, then Pilot 200. Then I said, okay, there is no way I could puncture this proximal cap. A Stato 20 gram tip, 0 0.009, Pilot 200. A Stato 40 gram tip, Pilot 200, then guy a third. And actually, I was able to cross it. Um, uh, I had to rotoblate it, nothing will go. Then this is after rotoblation, this is how much calcium. This is our, the results. So what are they? Astato XS20 and Astato XS40. And I think these wires are approved for the peripheral. This is not approved for the coronary. Again, this is not approved for the coronary, so for the uh, FDA in the panel, uh, in, the, in the audience. Uh, but when you have to be successful uh, and be safe, if you know where to poke, you can use them. Another problem we face with calcium is you do an ADR, integrate dissection reentry. You set up, you have a very good distal vessel. Look at the big LED here. I thought I'm going to puncture it. I punctured, and I thought the, wi the wire is in the true lumen, but I couldn't kind of uh, puncture and drive. So I put a pilot 200, and this is what I found. The, the, the pilot 200 just besides the LED. So, I just learned that actually Astato is good for calcium. If you notice, this is the Astato. Unfortunately, I don't have the puncture movement, but I actually added the secondary bend in it, and there you go. We punctured, and now we have the Pilot 200 stick and swap. 
So this is, this is another lesson I learned last year. This is the final LED uh, picture. So uh, the Stingray is a 12 gram uh, uh, tip wire. It's a pre-shaped one millimeter. There is a barbed wire at the end of it that actually frequently is damaged and it doesn't work and uh, you can't use it. So now a lot of operators are moving to Hornet 14, which is 14 gram tip and it's tapered to 0.008 and Astato X, um, S20, which is a uh, 20 gram tip and it tapered to 0.009. I have not used Astato um, 40 yet. So what if Astato is not enough? This is actually a stented CTO. This is a left main stent into the LED, stented the circ shut. And this is a failed cabbage to the, to the, to the circ. So what to do here? This is a baseline. We went retrograde epicardial collaterals through SVG to the RCA. And now we kind of trying to go retrograde. The worst thing you can do with retrograde wire goes outside the stent. You have, a, the more you try, the bigger the space, you can puncture into the stent again. So I, I, this is how it goes. I have retrograde Xi'an blue that actually crossed the collaterals. Gaia third, because that's very directional. Pilot 200, because I had to knuckle closer. Then I went back to Gaia third, try, try, try it, wouldn't go. Then I tried Confianza Pro 12 anti-grade, Pilot 200, Astato 20, Astato 40. And then you have to resort to really uh, extraordinary measures. Confianza Pro 12 with a Bovi at 50 uh, joules. This is unipolar, similar to what we use to puncture from the IVC to the, uh, to the aorta. Then it didn't work, so I went Bovi 70 joules. Then I went back again, 70 joules Bovi. And then I tried actually a little bit to go and with, a, with a, a, a Gaia third, and here the Gaia third going right cross and using the retrograde wire. So what I think the, uh, the Bovi did is actually softened the plaque so I could cross it retrograde. And it was um, uh, successful. I had to use road ablation as you can tell. This is the final result actually after two procedures because he has another CTO of the OM and I have to actually do it in a separate procedure. So Bovi wire set up, this is how you set it up in the back. The, this is um, uh, Bill Nicholson, the, the basically he virtually invented this and uh, you, hold it, you hold the bovi with the wire, uh, the back of the wire with the hemostat, make sure nothing uh, wet and then you go. And more than that, uh, Bill Nicholson is actually using uh, the bovi to re-enter for ADR. So I have not done that yet and uh, hopefully that, uh, that will happen soon. You still fail. In this case I have anti-grade. Uh, 40 Astato, 70 joules didn't go, and retrograde 40 Astato, 70 joules didn't go, and finally what we had to do, we went around the stent because it was a fracture stent and did it. We took a little bit detour around the old stent. In conclusions, wire with higher penetration power can be used when anatomy is known. You have to know where you're poking. If you don't know the anatomy, do not poke, unless you have a CT like Farouk, uh, transcatheter uh, electrosurgery is coming on the horizon and hopefully going to be used more and more and there is just a report in Jack about bipolar, both wires kind of creating an arc. If all failed, you re really have to be creative. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yes, Sam. Great presentation, Cal. I find myself using more and more Astato 20 to re-enter with a Stingray. Should it be our go-to now wire to all, uh, to all the entries uh, uh, with, with a Stingray balloon? Is that what you guys are doing? Yeah, I, I think the Astato is, uh, it, because the enemy of the re-entry is the calcium, and basically the Stingray wire slides off the calcium, and you can't, you can't puncture. So, you have to ensure puncturing. And I think that, that I, I just talked to the, the, the uh, Stingray wire is made by Boston, trying to convince them to do it 40 gram tip uh, Stingray wire or at least 20 gram tip. So that's actually coming. Yes, Manos. So Carl, that was a phenomenal uh, prescription. I think a lot of excitement, both for the Astado and for the uh, electro, um, electric re-entry. Now, for people, what I guess you should say, make sure 100% before you do this, you know where you're going. Because if you burn a hole in a place that's the wrong place, it's a problem, right? So number one. 
Number two, people are asking, why don't you get the back end of the wire and push it? Have you ever done that, or do you recommend it? I, I did it, but it did not work uh, because you can go in a subentum. The problem with the back of the wire, it's changed the anatomy. When you push it in, it's so hard. It changes the anatomy. It straightens the segment you go into. So if you are talking about an osteal uh, disease um, a, or very proximal disease where you don't have a tortuosity, and it might damage the, the, the microcatheter when you push it through. I've done it a long time ago, and it didn't work back then, but I was not actually a CTO operator back then. I was in 2006. So um, it's a great idea. I might do it. Did you do it? Well, so I've done it, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> the problem is it's very hard to see because the front end has a radio opaque segment, yeah. the back you don't. So yeah. actually, I say most people don't do that because it's hard to see, and you may go to places you don't want to go. But I think for people who don't want to go extreme, so to speak, you know, Hornet 14 is the stiffest wire from the quote-unquote coronary wire. So Hornet 14, Confianza Pro 12, still remain good choices for this group. But I love the, the technique as well. Thank you, Manos. Was there a microcatheter on that wire when you oh, yeah. it? A microcatheter? Or was the wire the is Oh yes, you have to put a microcatheter and you have to pick a microcatheter with insulation because if you're not, the electricity would not be concentrated in one spot or you have to have an insulated wire. So I use actually, uh, uh, I, first time I used uh, the Kerville, it's actually melted the tip of the catheter. So now I use either Micro 14 or uh, Fine Cross because they are plastic and completely insulated. Uh, the other metal wire uh, catheters might not work, that's what I think. Yeah, uh, Bill Nicholson comment on that. We, we had one case, and we could not get it to work with a Corsair, but it was able to work with a turnpike. So, And I think he's described turnpikes being used. But there is, we, we really need to understand these insulating properties um, yeah. of each of these microcatheters. Yeah, it's electricity. So if you don't, if, you, if it's not insulated, it's going to dissipate through the whole tissues. And, uh, and uh, the, I think the, uh, the, uh, the turnpike, and uh, they have coating in the inside, so they, that's why they sometimes work. But if you abrade, like if the coating is gone, you will not really be able to kind of have that unipolar electricity concentrated at the tip. So one just, last just, thing, people have seen the, the plasma wire. So Japan, there is a new system where it has two wires and they make essentially an arc of electricity through this, several thousand volt. Now, can you do this with uh, your technique? Get two uh, wires and make them connect? in a reverse card so, or otherwise? So it's, a, it's a difference between unipolar and bipolar. So it's a different setting. You actually can do that. Uh, like Kato and his team did, did seven cases in Japan. And I was surprised it took them like, uh, there are two cases they almost failed. And, um, and I think their concentration, I think what we need to think the next step is to facilitate re-entry. And when you have calcium, uh, Basically, sometimes you can't, but I think we can do it. But I just, we just have to figure out the setting on the Bovi machine. So just a quick comment. So I actually happened to be visiting Bill when he did one of these cases, and he just published it. Um, so I told him he, he should call it the electric stingray. I think that's what we call it, right? So <laughs> the stingray and then use the electric. <laughs> All right. Any, uh, uh, so now the next speaker, I have the honor of presenting um, my co-fellow um, and co-victim of Ashner, uh, orbital atherectomy and CTO-PCI, Salman Rain. It's the mouse, huh? Yeah. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this. Oh, it's you again, so. Yeah, you clicked on, click Sorry. on your name and then start. That's how you get extra time. 10 seconds. Okay, fantastic. So you know when, when the invitation went out and I had all these cool tricks, it turns out that a lot of them are already being done and they're already on the menu today. So I said, well, what can I talk about? So I'm going to talk about orbital atherectomy for CTOs. Uh, no, no disclosures. So we know that atherectomy for CTOs is basically utilized in two settings similar to the way you do for non-CTO PCI. You have the balloon uncrossable and the balloon undilatable lesions. The combined incidence in the CTO literature is anywhere from 6 to 12 percent. I think every year Manos kind of updates this. The latest number is at 12 percent. And the use of atherectomy is safe in a variety of settings. So there are case reports, there are case series, and actually some larger case series that have looked at laser atherectomy and they've looked at rotational atherectomy. However, 
not much about orbital atherectomy out there. <clears throat> this is taken from Manas's ex excellent book and, and his lectures. These are just two algorithms within algorithms. So this is a term that Bill Lombardi uses. So you have the hybrid algorithm, but for everything that you do or you don't do or you can't do, there should be another algorithm. So the one on the right is the balloon and crossable CTO algorithm. The one on the left is the balloon and dilatable. And you can see that the atherectomy is there for both of them. It is not first line, however. So one thing to realize is that typically we're taught not to atherectomize after using balloon angioplasty. Typically, this is done when balloons have been used. But again, there's very limited experience with orbital atherectomy, which is why I suspect it's not listed on either of these two charts. OK. So the first case, is, so when do you use it? So I'm going to show you two cases where we almost had to use it. And this <laughs> shows you the spectrum of what can go right and what can go wrong with this. OK. So 75-year-old man with progressive ejection <laughs> dyspnea, ejection fraction 45% with apical hypokinesis, moderate enter, uh, anterior wall and uh, anterolateral ischemia. This is a dual uh, sort of angiogram. You can see that this is a long CTO of the LAD, and there perhaps may be two CTOs. I'll let that uh, run one more time. There's a retrograde collateral from the PDA is thin, supplies about an inch in the mid-segment, but is diseased. And then there's a much larger epicardial collateral um, here. So in terms of scoring this, you know, JCTO score of three, progress CTO score of two. You know, the cap is somewhat ambiguous as a high risk stenosis just proximal to it. Um, uh, you know, the target is well defined, however, the lesion length is long and there's a second CTO in there. Um, and so we decided that we would try with an anti-grade uh, wire escalating strategy. If that failed, we'd try anti-grade dissection reentry, and if not, we'd bring him back and try epicardial. So going ahead, so this is the first, so first of all, we had challenges just getting into that cap, and so we ended up using a turnpike spiral and a samurai wire. The samurai is Boston's version of Scion. We got into that septal got the catheter out there, then pulled the wire out, redirected the catheter, then we used a fighter wire, that's Samurai, that's uh, Boston's version of the Fielder XT, it has a .008 tip, got that into the cap, and I said, we're making good progress. But here you can see now that the catheter is starting to buckle a bit. So this spiral catheter is somewhat bulkier than the LP, and you can see where the grooves are, the spiral, they're biting into the tissue, it's buckling a bit. I said, okay, well that's not working. Uh, so we advanced the, 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 the wire and then changed out for a turnpike LP and it made somewhat progress and not a whole lot. And again, as we were talking, sometimes we keep twisting this catheter to start to stick and that's the first sign that the tip may be getting frayed. At that time, we needed more support. So here we've got a guide liner now. The by this time, the guide is also a little softer. So we couldn't get the turnpike in there. So I said, well, let's see. We need something a little bit more robust. You know, we don't have tornus. We let that go. So we, this is turnpike gold. Again, and that, I just wanted to show this. I don't recommend spinning the gold this much. You can only spin it in one direction, but that's how much force is on the tip of that gold catheter is just not working. Uh, you know, there are other options. For example, could we have done this with, you know, an anchor technique? We thought about that. With the guide liner, it's very hard to get a second piece of equipment down there. We had seven French system. But we, we took the turnpike out. The tip was frayed. So we took a new turnpike and confirmed that actually we had made some progress. So this balloon uncrossable lesion is now a balloon un, uh, sort of, uh, we want to the second CTO. God, time is almost out. Okay, so, so we tried to start at 20. We tried a confianza. I couldn't cross with that. Tried an Astaro. I'm going to talk faster now. Finally got the hornet to go in. Did not want to work over the hornet. So I said, let me try getting more balloons. Did that, that did not work. Did bam. You know, tried to get stuff down there. We tried to bam with the 1.5. Actually, here at the tip of that catheter actually is a balloon fragment from that previous bam. I just did not feel comfortable working over the hornet or pushing it forward because we're right at the collateral. As the last ditch effort, what we decided to do was take the wire out and put in a viper wire with a CTO bend on it. And we got that through that little channel that the hornet had made, got it across. And here you can see that we changed out, we did our atherectomy. This is post atherectomy results. This is angioplasty stenting. This is what the final looks like. So again, this was a true uncrossable lesion, and, and ultimately we had to just put, push the viper through with a CTO bend. Okay, this might go quicker. It's a, CTO, a woman who has an RCA occlusion, she has a stent on the right side, on the left side, <clears throat> the flush occlusion of the ostium, we decided to go with the retrograde first. And this is one of those cases we had yesterday. Those of you in the session yesterday, we had a live case like this where the septals look pretty decent, but they're not very good. And you can try multiple septals, and you just, you get hung up on tortuosity. We tried multiple wires. In fact, the only good collateral that I see is that second septal, and that's a retrograde takeoff behind a stent strut. So rather than mess with that, we tried, we said, you know what, we'll just try the anterior dissection reentry strategy. 
I changed out my guide to uh, AL guide, Turnpike LP, and here's the Confianza Pro 12. I've scratched, I've made my little submittal plane. And so a wire that I like for tracking is the Raider. So we, this, is, this is like a Pilot 200, maybe more support Pilot 400, think of it like that, with a longer ribbon at the tip. I like it for knuckling because what you can do is you can make a knuckle and you can twist the wire to tighten up the knuckle if it doesn't tighten up for you. Push it and you can untwist it. So you can't do that with any of the other wires. You can see we've gotten across. We re-entered distally the picture to confirm. Went ahead and we got a one, O balloon, and again, we tried to get the one O balloon across that mid portion, and I just can't seem to do it. We did BAM there, that did not work. We tried a two O balloon, that did not work. So once again, we said, well, it worked for us a few weeks ago, let's do the same thing. Same thing, we took the Viper, took the radar out, and got the CTO curve, got the Viper across, and went across, it looks really good. We used uh, CSI, we used the Glide Assist for the proximal segment. And here's a live thing, and I just want to show the good, excellent technique I was using. They said, you go too fast. I said, okay, I'll slow it down. You slowly advance it. And what happens is that the thing gets uh, jammed in there and just stalls. So this whole thing, <laughs> it cuts both ways. It does really cut deep both ways. It does not come out. So the thing was jammed. So to actually get it out, I had to pull on the wire and the device, and everything came out, so, which was kind of, sort of tragic. But I said, okay, let me go ahead and rewire this. And I've rewired it, and what you may notice is that the wire trajectory is slightly different now. It's not hugging the calcium like it once was, and we took a picture, and there you see this uh, perforation. So that's the other aspect of it. Okay, so I said, what do you do? I said, well, first of all, let's not anticoagulate. <clears throat> Get ready to uh, you know, uh, harvest some fat. Phone a friend, and I call Bill Lombardi, this was my first fat embolization. I said, hey, Bill, this is what's going on. He said, yes, this is what you need to do. If the fat embolization doesn't work, you can inject thrombin, but you just give protamine and take everything out. Don't wait. And I said, well, I'm not really sure about that uh, distal flow. Actually, before I called Bill, what I had done in the meantime is I put a balloon up. This is the first strategy is you have to put a balloon up to stop the bleeding. And this is just a 2 balloon at very gentle pressure, so clearly we have the channel there. The problem with that, however, is that it, it secures the ongoing channel. So I said, I'm really still not really sure about this fat embolization. I'm doing this for the first time. I said, let me make sure that I still have wire access. So we took a twin pass catheter, put a second wire down, put the micro catheter, a fine cross over the second wire, and use that to embolize fat. So I would still had secure wire across into the true lumen. And what ended up happening is we didn't get, <laughs> we, we did not get, we did not get hemostasis, but we got SD elevation. So part of that fat actually went down. So we actually have anti-grade flow, and I really don't want to, uh, I guess I don't know what to do. So at that point, the thrombin idea sounded good. I just did not want to inject thrombin down the RCA. So we basically put a microcatheter, put a fine cross into the actual hematoma. We did an echo by this point and confirmed that this was in the wall of the right ventricle and not uh, a pericardial, true pericardial effusion. Um, and then we basically put a balloon approximately, balloon occlusion approximately, this is the microcatheter in the little hematoma, and injected some thrombin out there, and then afterwards we took everything out, and uh, this is just our final angiography about 10, 15 minutes later, and you can see the flow has actually stopped. And she actually did well, she was a little shook up, but she uh, called to say that she felt better, so that as an investment, this worked perfectly. As a case, it's not so glamorous or elegant, but now she wants to come back and have the thing taken care of permanently. Okay, so what have I learned about orbital atherectomy within the past year? This is the lessons. Number one, orbital atherectomy is a double-edged sword that should be used with caution. It's not a matter of being a good technology or a bad technology. It is what it is. It does its job. It's a matter of appropriate use. So what is appropriate use? It's best suited for balloon and crossable and undilatable occlusions, which are relatively straight. What's the angle? I don't know, 45 degrees or less maybe. And the wire is intraluminal. That's where it works best. Probably should not be used in subintimal areas, especially if the subintimal plane is going across an angle. And finally, balloon predilatation is not a contraindication to the use of orbital atherectomy. And in fact, uh, you know, I think many times, more often than not, we end up using balloons, failing, and then using one of these devices. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sal, for uh, showing this case. Uh, it's really, I, I, that one time I actually sent um, a text, or I can't remember, it was a tweet. Would you use uh, orbital atherectomy in a subintimal space? And the answer from Aaron Grantham said, I would not wobble in a subintimal space. It's like, just like one sentence. And now we know why. <laughs>
Exactly. Any questions? We actually, um, uh, although you took longer time, but that's a great learning point. Anybody has any um, comments? Should, should, should we conclude from this that we should not probably use orbital atherectomy in CTOs, period? Because you can never be 100% sure that your wire went through and through all the way in the true lumen. So many times you're in a dissection plane and back in a, in a true lumen distance. I, I think that's a fantastic point. So again, both of these situations are where I actually um, wasn't able to get any equipment across, and that was the last dish thing where we took the wire out. So one thing is, should we be taking out the wire once we've crossed a CTO? That's one thing. Uh, but I'll tell you, so we had a similar case, and, and the reason I don't think we need to do this anymore is, um, you know, CSI has, we don't have threader, we don't have glider, but they have a new balloon called Sapphire, and they've got, it's a one millimeter balloon, and that worked fantastic. I mean, I, so I had another situation where I really couldn't get any balloons down, I tried the 1.520, we bammed it twice, we bammed the 1.25 for a Mavit, that balloon didn't work, and those typically, you know, get in deep into that. But that Sapphire seemed to do the trick now, maybe that the other balloons had softened it, but the point is, once we had the Sapphire, we could then change out for, you know, the Turnpike LP and, and, and put different wire, in which case we could have used a road in this situation. Is that, in fact, I asked, I asked the Vasco Solution, which is marketing, uh, not Vasco Solution, CSI, which marketing it for Orbis Niche, I think, to make yes. it over the wire. Because what I had experience with the Sapphire one millimeter balloon, it will actually go, it's an RX, you dilate the lesion and you come back with your microcatheter, it still would not go. So you come back with the sapphire, now winged, it will go. You come back with a 1.5 balloon like Emerge or Trek or something, and still wouldn't go. So I think that's the only balloon I might, I might use over the wire. Otherwise, um, no use for over the wire balloons. Um, this is a really, really illustrative case. When you injected thrombin, did you have a distal balloon up to prevent reflux down the right corner? Exactly. So, so I actually didn't know where to position that balloon. I didn't want to position over it because my feeling was if I position it right over there, it might expand that hole and that, that calcium might be pulled apart some more. Um, but what we did was, and it doesn't show you in this, is actually we injected uh, from the retrograde. So once we recreated that CTO, there was flow going in this direction. And it was just a drop of thrombin, uh, but we took everything out. But, and, and then we put the balloon down to restore flow that way. But the answer is no, not distal to it, uh, though we thought about that. That would have been the best way to do it. I, I, I think, that, that, I think yeah. that would have been great, like to put a balloon yeah. distal, balloon proximal, and a microcatheter yes, in the middle, yes. and put an, uh, or actually just go ahead and put a covered stent. Like if you put a covered stent, you know committed, it's going to occlude, yeah. but you're going to come back and open at both ends, and you're done. He probably would have had to really definitively treat it with Rhoda and expand yeah. that whole plan. So yeah. Yeah. that was so that's I gave him yeah. the covered yeah. stent, and and I, let's just say that you know, in our cath lab, these things get scrutinized, and as it is, I'm trying to get the CTO program going. Um, Not a great case yeah, for yeah. scrutiny. One covered <laughs> stent, one, one, one covered stent per month. That's okay, twin pass. This is the talk uh, by um, uh, Ashish. Uh, Ashish is um, basically one of the most uh, experienced intervention cardiologists and CTO, um, although he does a structural, but he's the only one in the world who can do both. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> uh, Thanks for uh, having me. It's been uh, a great meeting, so uh, I don't know why it says no files have been uploaded. It's a problem. Okay. Can somebody help me in, from the AV side? Maybe move to the next presentation. And yeah, let's, let's, sure. Ashish, let's move to the next presentation. So um, that actually fortunate because Ashish talks are always very good, so I like to hear him last. Um, the next talk will be um, how to effectively close an SVG. I love this talk um, because I hate SVGs. So, Kathleen Toma again is uh, going to teach us how to do that. Great title. All right, so um, all my um, preceding talkers have been talking about how to open things. I'm going to talk about how to close things, which is sometimes something that we have to do. And um, to illustrate that, I'm going to start with an interesting case we did. Um, originally a couple of years ago actually of a gentleman that's 76 years old he had four vessel cabbage a while back he did okay for a long period of time and then he started developing some symptoms again 
At some point he had PCI of his SVG to the um, occluded RCA. Um, uh, he has dystonic exertion, fatigue and dizziness. He has a positive stress test with inferior wall ischemia. And his referring doctor um, orders a CTA. And as you can see on this CTA, the problem is, if I get the pointer to work, that there is a, um, an aneurysm in the mid portion of the SVG to the RCA that's partially thrombosed and it's compressing the SVG. So the thinking is that this is creating ischemia. You can also see that his RCA, his native RCA is completely occluded. So the question is, what do we do with this? Um, the thinking was that we're gonna take him to the lab and um, open up his native RCA and then at the end of that, close this SVG so um, we eliminate this aneurysm. So we brought him to the cath lab. These are um, dual injections. You can see here the flow through the SVG, retrofilling the RCA. This is the portion where the aneurysm is. You see a little pulsatility here. I'm not gonna go over the details of the CTO PCI. We ended up going retrograde, did reverse CART, and got a good result. And at the end, we decided to close this. And um, we do this sometimes for this SVGs following opening of the native vessel. In this case, we elected to go with um, coils, and we placed four six millimeter axiom coils right at the area of um, stenosis here. And at the end, as you can see, we have nice flow through the native RCA, which is important. Um, and we have very uh, limited flow, but still some flow through the, um, through the SVG. So in a situation like this, one hopes that this slowly thromboses in time and everybody's happy, right? So just because of the aneurysm, we elected to bring this guy back. And um, it didn't look quite uh, like what we expected. So, Several problems, not only that there is flow through this SVG, it looks like there is flow through and through through this SVG. The aneurysm is still there and it actually has flow in it now. And not only it has flow, it has a fistula to the right atrium. So things have gotten a little more complicated now than, than what we're hoping for. So the question is, what do we do with this now, right? So um, the other question here is whether his RCA is, native RCA is patent or not. It kind of looks patent here, but it's hard to tell because you have so many stents in there. So we talked to the CT surgeons, and the thinking was take him to the lab, define this anatomy really well, and if it's indeed communicating from both ends, this aneurysm, the only solution that we have is probably a, um, a surgical intervention because if you close one limb of this, there will still be flow from the other limb into this aneurysm. So we took him to the lab, and of course the RCA uh, PCI result looks great. And the lucky thing was that this vein graft is actually not continuous. So the retro, the, the distal part of this vein graft past the coils that we placed, it's actually occluded. But it does feel anti-grade, and as you can see here, these coils are floating inside this, uh, this aneurysm now, and there's clear communication to the right atrium. Interestingly enough, when you engage this, the pressure drops instantly to basically systemic venous pressure. So the question now was, well, do we have a better solution than sending this guy to surgery? So now this thing potentially fills from the proximal limb, from the right atrium, but it does not fill from the retro limb, and we have a patent RCA. So it's kind of the best case scenario here. So we elected to try again to close this in a more definitive fashion, and this time we used a vascular plug because Quas didn't do it that well the first time. So this is a, an AVP4 that's placed in the proximal segment of the uh, vein graft. Um, luckily, there's actually a stent there that makes things so much easier. Um, five minutes later, we inject some dye, and we finally managed to close this thing. Perfect. And just to be 100% sure, we brought him back a few months later for a repeat CTA. And again, you can see here the um, AVP in place. The graft is definitely closed. And importantly, there's no flow in this aneurysm. So presumably, it's thrombosed now. Echo looks OK. So we finally achieved victory. So when do we close these things? Um, in this scenario, when you have an aneurysm of the vein graft, that's, that's probably a good indication. I've seen some disasters with patients who um, actually rupture this aneurysm, or when there's significant competitive flow after you fix the native vessel. This is an example of that. This is a gentleman that had a prox LAD CTO with a degenerated vein graft to this LAD. Uh, we fixed the native, but as you can see here in the middle panel, there is strong competitive flow still from this vein graft. If you leave it like this, there's a good chance the stents are gonna thrombose. 
So we elected to coil this thing and we got a nice result with, um, with good flow in the native. Again, this doesn't happen immediately. This coils almost never in my experience have closed these vessels instantly. There's always some flow. The coils that you use depend on what you're familiar with, what you have in your lab. Um, Medtronic and Boston Scientific make these uh, coils. You need a slightly larger microcatheter to deliver. Um, the vascular plug, the AVP, is a, um, a, a product that can be used here as well. This is the fourth generation um, vascular plug. It's sized, uh, the size is suitable for vein grafts. You have to oversize it a little bit. Um, it's easy to deploy uh, and if you, need, uh, if you need questions, if you need to figure out how to deploy this, just ask the guy who does PFOs in your, in your lab because he'll, he'll tell you exactly how to use this thing. And this is my two cents on when to use one versus the other. Of course, there's no data in the, in the um, cardiac literature, but there's some data in the, um, in the interventional uh, radiology literature. Um, they are equally expensive, so a coil is almost as much as an AVP. So if you use four coils, that gets a little more expensive. And probably the more flow you, f you have, the more likely you, I, it, it's a, a better idea to use a, a vascular plug rather than coils. And I just want to finish with this. This is from the CTO of Fundamentals Community website. A couple of years ago, this question came up, um, and people have suggested that perhaps we should collect data about the SVG coiling and see if we should do this routinely following um, native um, CTO PCI or not. And I think the consensus is this, that if you have a very good flow to this vein graft after you fix the native, perhaps coiling the, um, the vein is, is the way to go. But if the flow is poor, the vein graft will close on its own. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so any, anybody have any questions or uh, comment? Uh, a question I asked a few days ago. So, you know, I always struggle with this. You know, in this case, that second case, the LED or the, that main graph almost had like a Lima type flow. It's very brisk, but when it's not brisk and you fix a CTO and, and the majority of the flow is going through your coronary, do you still have to do it? I, I just don't know when to do it. I feel uncomfortable shutting down a graph that's almost on its way out anyway. No, I agree. I mean, I, that's exactly the point. If you inject your native and you have good flow past the anastomosis, I think you're good. But if you inject the native and there's no flow past the anastomosis, the, then probably you should think about because the stents are going to thrombose and, you know. I actually have a stent thrombose because I did not close the SVG. The first time I did it, I was a new at Henry Ford Hospital and they sent me to the principal's house. Uh, office because they can a peer review committee and all nine yards and, 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 and um, so I did not do it for a long time until I had another patient who had a lot of competition and basically um, uh, stand from both. But the, the, the choice of uh, coil is, uh, is really important here. And, and so what's your preference? Is it the, the, uh, that uh, uh, vascular plug device or the coils? Well, after this experience, I would go with an AVP, to be honest with you. If you have yeah. a landing zone to place it, because it's much more material that you place in the graft. So that mm -hmm. leads to a mu much more effective you know, closure of the quills. You never get, you know, you, you put four or five quills, and at some point you start thinking, well, it's going to be. And, and in the coil, you have to put an anchor coil at the beginning. You put the biggest coil you, you have. That will be the anchor coil. And then you tack coils above it. And, it's, and the coils, the other drawback to them, they are very radiopaque. So the, if you put them above your cardiac cellulite, the, you're not going to be able to see your heart later. So the, the, the vascular plug is actually a lot less radiopaque and a lot more effective. Thank you so much, Thanks, uh, nice. Catalina. All right. <laughs> Back to Ashish. <laughs> so I think uh, I'm just getting cooked up here. So, um, so the, the, it, it's really interesting questions. When you have an SVG, like Manos and I looked at the SVG uh, maze rate, the one-year maze rate, and Manos basically did most of the trials, and he looked at the basically retrospective, and in, even there is another trial they just reported. The, the maze rate in SVG, after, it's really high, and target vessel revascularization, while the, the worst target vessel revascularization in the CTO is about 13% for very long dissections. And, and, and so I, I am of the, 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 uh, the thought that if you can fix the native, it will be better. But also, if you're fixing graphs or treating graphs, my only caveat is do not stent across the distal anastomosis because Absolutely. that is a disaster. Because people that end up uh, treating graft disease 
without paying attention to that can create a whole host of problems down the road when we have to actually treat the native because the entire anatomy is distorted and it's really hard to get back both retrograde or anti-grade. Great comment. Yeah, so. All right, sounds great. So I'm gonna in a very short period of time talk about uh, uh, a catheter that sort of bailed me out. It's called a twin pass torque. For people that haven't heard about it, I'll give you a little brief description of it and, uh, and describe how it helped me in this case. So this is a 57-year-old male patient with class three angina despite good medical therapy. He had like a PCI of his proximal vein graft, which was failing uh, in December, and then um, uh, ended up uh, trying to have a attempt uh, a retrograde by another operator while the graft was open uh, to open up the native, but was unsuccessful and complicated by a distal dissection in the ongoing posterior lateral branch. And, and that attempt was aborted, and the patient was then referred back three months later, and, and I attempted to uh, open up his native right coronary, I think in April. So uh, as you can see, uh, hopefully my movies are going to play now. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh here. There you go. So this is the vein graft to the uh, right coronary. As you can see, uh, it's been stented and there's uh, distal diffuse disease beyond the graft. And, uh, and uh, I think what ended up happening was that in an attempt to go retrograde through that acute angle, they roughed up the distal anastomosis and then there was ongoing dissection into the posterior lateral branch. And uh, that's when they decided to call it quits. But luckily, this is not stented across the distal anastomosis. If this was stented, then it would pretty much be impossible to use this graft. Yeah, so, so ended up, we planned uh, since the previously attempt, it was a legitimate retrograde attempt. I decided that I would go anti-grade dissection re-entry as my planned strategy. We basically ended up using a Fielder XT, as you can see on the left panel, that knuckled pretty easily along with an AL.75 and a trap liner, along with a turnpack spiral to the distal anastomosis. I was using my vein graft to mark the distal vessel. And then I got lucky. Uh, the XT, along with uh, the uh, microcatheter, sort of just went straight down and, and sort of re-entered into the PDA, which is pretty uh, common. Um, getting one of those two branches. Of course, our goal was to preserve both branches, so this wasn't gonna be enough for us. So the wire enters the distal uh, true lumen of the PDA. And then, this is how uh, the graft connects to the PL. So I'm like, how is this uh, gonna get sorted out? And this, this is an LAO view, this is another view. And it just looks to me that uh, the PL uh, uh, comes across the native and where is the distal bifurcation now and where does the graft actually tie in. So those were all questions that I, I think I'll pose the panel, but I couldn't sort out and was sort of confused. Um, and so that's where I was kind of like stuck in this case and kind of really was so, unable to figure this out. So, so just a question to Farouk, will CT help us here? Well, pre-procedural CT might allow you to figure out the best angle to expose that bifurcation, so you would actually have a chance to plan it ahead of your procedure. You might have to do something very unusually angulated or mm -hmm. 70 or something like that to see this. So you can sometimes actually play with the angles that would expose it, so that way it's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, in real time, if you can segment it and then use that exposed angle, that would also help. Could you, could you have put the wire again through the SVG down that uh, posterior lateral branch? I mean, so we had flow down the posterior lateral branch. Yeah. So that was not, uh, I mean, I, couldn't, I knew where it was. I just didn't know where it connected. Exactly. So. All right. So how did you solve it? So this was this weird angle. As you can see, the steep RAO caudal view, which potentially gave me some inkling as to where there might be uh, this early bifurcation that comes off. Uh, in the right coronary where the PD and the PL bifurcate. And on the right panel, I ended up having to use a twin pass torque and a Pilot 200, as you can see, uh, getting into the posterior lateral branch. And you can see it comes off, I mean, in pretty, un I mean, of course, granted this is an unusual view, but even the takeoff seems rather unusual where it really comes off, uh, which is not a typical uh, view that you would use to sort the bifurcation out. Had you run an IVUS down there yet? I had, and that didn't help. 
that going down the native right, I just couldn't see because the previous stent in the, the graft was sort of inhibiting my views. And, and you have to remember, it's tented. Yeah. So, like, yeah. it's completely, the anatomy is completely distorted. distorted. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. So, a twin pass, just to know what a twin pass is, these are both dual lumen catheters, the twin pass and the twin pass torque. Um, they are both fabulous <clears throat> to, uh, to uh, get into side branches or in circumstances like these. The important thing is that the shaft construction of the twin pass torque is slightly different. It has a stainless steel braid, and the distal tip length is a little bit shorter as compared to the twin pass, which is sort of important to know because you want to know where the proximal lumen is so you can re-enter. And then the dual lumen outer diameters are sort of comparable, maybe slightly bigger. But it's important because you can, the over-the-wire lumen exit port has a deflection angle which allows you to access side branches, which is sort of what our goal was. And I got these lights courtesy Sunu, who's right here, and, and uh, thankful for that. So deployment tricks, again, don't over-rotate this in any one direction because you can have a wire wrap. You can uh, basically, it's similar to a, a clockwise or counterclockwise rotation with any of our microcatheters. You identify the orientation of the exit port either by the offset marker band or you, I like I did, which I didn't know at that point, just use the trial and error method using my guide wire tip. So uh, ultimately, I ended up uh, uh, killing the graft once I got in and I uh, used uh, the Azure coils, which is sort of our go-to strategy to coil grafts, especially if the diffusely diseases wasn't so hard because the graft was, uh, it was, it just landed right at the distal end of the graft and just prior to the anastomosis and was able to close the graft. And once we closed the graft, uh, we ended up uh, treating the right. And as you can see, the distal, once I stented that PL, the distal dissection from the previous attempt was still, was still there, but the flow was brisk, and I didn't want to chase myself down all the way into the posterior lateral branch, and I just left that alone. So at the end of the case, the guy got a dis good result. He had both his PD and PL preserved, and as you can see, the right corner is a pretty decent-sized target, and he's been doing well and symptom-free since. Awesome. So thanks for your attention. So this is another strategy to close the SVG, just to stent across the anastomosis, right? That's right. That's you right. know, and that view, uh, uh, Ashish used like the audio caudal. When I was a fellow, uh, my uh, mentor back then, and he kind of showed me like I, we were struggling to wire. It's the best view to open that bifurcation. It always surprised, and but you get end up scratching your head, which is PDA, which is pistolata branch. But it's really a very good view when you're stuck in audio. And Cardinal. Um, any 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 questions? Any comments? I, you know, I think the twin pass torque is fantastic cases, by the way. Oh, thank um, you. you know, we, we had one case where I truly, I, I, that's you know, that's when I just bought into this catheter. Was actually we ended up doing a star as an investment procedure and an RCA and the RCA. Um, I was hoping it would go into the PDA, but the the, the wire knuckle into okay. the posterior lateral branch. So. so Okay. I'm going to interrupt you because people start leaving. I have an announcement. At the 38th, uh, 38th floor, there is a reception for everybody with the faculty at 5.30. Today, right, Manos? At the 38th floor. So the people who left, they're going to miss out, but uh, you guys are all invited. So, so, I'll, so I'll make it quick. So anyway, so the point is, so we used the twin pass to actually star into the, the PDA. So that we did a double star, and we left it and came back and stented the bifurcation. So the twin pass is very versatile, does amazing things. Yes. So we're going to move to uh, 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 Minute Vu. He always give interesting talks. Uh, um, device entrapment during retrograde CTO PCI. And if any complication uh, need to happen, minute know how to uh, solve it. I'm not sure if that a compliment, but. <laughs> uh, can we get this on? Or the other computer, I think. Be closer to this is not your computer. So can we switch the computer, please? That's a uh, yeah, that HDMI. HDMI. Yeah. You can see the real city operators troubleshoot everything. <laughs> and you also see the collaboration. You have a problem, your partner comes to save you. Oh, it's a slight demonstration of the CTO PCI mentality. <laughs> so I know my, my, my talk is last, so I keep it very short, less than uh, six minutes. So uh, this is a very, very simple, straightforward retrograde until we encounter an entrap and lost device. I'm there we glad, go. I'm glad so we it's an RCA uh, CTO. 
with a uh, very straightforward open uh, patent uh, vein graft, but to a very diseased PDA, the ischemia is in the PLV. So we use this re relatively easy vein graft to the distal um, right, backwards, reverse cart very easily, then externalized to R350. The problem is I only post-dilated the submental space with a 2.5. I never realized we really had to um, deal with calcium sub submental space. I've never had this problem before. So then we had stent regret after the 3.0 by 32 drug stents. stent. 3.5 non-compliant, unsuccessful in uh, fully dilating it. 3.5 unable to deliver it. Then 4.0 ruptured. When it ruptured, it obviously got entrapped at the site of under expansion. You could see me pulling the balloon. Now it's, pull it's yanking the entire vessel towards the guide. So at these, uh, for these kind of complications, you need some sort of algorithm, some sort of solutions. You can't randomly do things. So the first thing is a wire technique. So the first thing to do is advance a wire next to the entrapped device in order to d deliver a balloon and free it. So we attempted with the field XT, unsuccessful here. You can see on the left-hand side, the Pilot 200 uh, Pro 12 was all unsuccessful. So a couple of phone calls to the community members. The next thing you could do with the wires, use a very stiff wire, Pro 12, uh, Hornet 14, Astato to jab at the uh, device, uh, disintegrate the balloon, break up into little pieces, that may help. So we attempted that, that was unsuccessful. So that's the wire technique. The next thing to do is to retrieve this. There are multiple retrieving uh, technique. Uh, one is to snare. Uh, the problem with snaring here is because I'm externalized, I didn't want to snare the, the, the uh, retrograde uh, wire as well and uh, choke the heart. So I cut the uh, top of the balloon, advance the guide liner as close as possible to the site of entrapment. You can see it's actually at the site of entrapment. I pull as hard as I could. The, the problem now is I separate the push segment to flex segment. So remember that. So that was uh, the one thing uh, I didn't realize. I kept pulling and then it separated. So now I have an entrapped device and then a lost device. So I don't have access to this balloon except that it's on the externalized wire and it is uh, within the guideliner. So, then, so this is what you have right now in this situation. Um, so the next thing we tried was we said, might as well try a, a snare. The snare here would not go past the, uh, uh, the axillary artery uh, because of the uh, proximal part of the uh, guy liner, as well as parts of the balloon is hanging there somewhere. You don't know where it is. You can't really ride it over the, the snare. Uh, so a couple more phone calls to uh, some retrograde operators. So they said that what you could do now because you have a retrograde option, is to deliver your gear retrograde and push free your integrate and trap device. So you could uh, advance your microcatheter or balloon, so we attempted that, but those devices would not go to site of entrapment. But that's an option that for you to think about. Uh, we uh, attempted to uh, advance a guide liner uh, in a retrograde fashion in order to provide more support for retrograde gears to push free, we were unable to. So that's the other option. Then uh, we attempted with the knuckle. Uh, this is a Pro 12 knuckle. Uh, we just knuckle to uh, modify the plaque. Now, in this situation, I didn't really want a balloon because you, we have a stent that's unexpanded. You may collapse the stent further on your balloon, so I didn't want to deliver the uh, balloon. So now we're out of options. So what I had to do was do a last-ditch effort, remove the externalized wire, and uh, advance the balloon in the guide liner. So this is now the situation you have. You have no wire on your uh, lost device and your uh, entrapped device, uh, but it is in the guide liner, and that's a retrieval device that you could use. You advance a balloon, inflate the balloon to trap the entrapped balloon. Uh, once you have this, my hope is that I will pull the whole thing free, but if I don't, then I would just have an entrapped balloon hanging outside the aorta. Now, what's the worst outcome? So I call, we call a surgeon and say, what's the worst thing? They said, they're not gonna come in, uh, just to snip at the uh, ostium, the RCA. You're just going to anticoagulate or antiplatelet, so might as well do this um, man finer maneuver. So is that okay? Well, I have nothing to lose. Uh, what can you do? So you can see here, we're pulling as hard as we could, and the whole thing came free. On the right-hand side of the picture, you can see the inflated balloon trapping the entrapped balloon that is torn off on the left side of the, uh, of the picture. So this is what the, the, the image looks like, and uh, there are multiple things you could do. You could give up. Or you could do a uh, rotor stent, and you know, that's another topic on its own. There's your dissection. This patient actually did well and was home in a couple days without uh, any problems. Came back, but there's no distal vasculature, so we didn't uh, see any you know, long-term outcome. We didn't proceed on with this uh, procedure. So the main thing I learned here is that in the, even in the supplemental space, you can have uh, stent regret. So now I'm learning to uh, be more patient and uh, prep my, my supplemental space better after the reverse cart. Uh, and trap device uh, can happen. I know a lot of you guys may know the anti-grade option. Think about retrograde option as well to push it free. Uh, and it's very important to have community support like these guys, uh, ex expert operators, because collectively, 
you don't see this often, but collectively, we have collective experience, and, and next time we see this, we could solve it uh, more efficiently and safely for the patient. Thank you. Great, great safe. I just have one question. Yeah. Could you have pulled the retrograde, like you pull from the SVG side? Because, because what happened in this, the balloon's supposed to rupture this way, right? In this situation, I think what happened is actually parachuted. The balloon ruptured transverse. So you have that distal end of the balloon basically became a parachute. And the more you, it's kind of stuck in a stand. This is what I think. And could you have pulled everything the other way? But, you're, but it was an anterograde balloon. So we, yeah. we, we delivered an anterograde balloon. The only access to retrograde was the externalized wire, the R350. Exactly. Once you pull that, then you got nothing else. Then it's not riding on a wire, so you can't. You have to push it free from the retrograde end. But like, if you pulled it the other way, you might have been able just to release it. Like, it might have come so easy. Pull the, Through the uh, R350? Through the graft. Like, Through the R350. You have, to have to, you have to have something on the end of the balloon, in the cut. wire, that actually it's going to grab, grab the balloon with it. Oh, but there's nothing because it's R350. Yeah. It would just slide off. Yes, exactly. Really great, great case, man. And we, we had a recent ruptured balloon as we were trying to anchor, anchor a, a guide liner all the way down. It was actually a trap liner, which turned out to be very fortuitous. Two things. The balloon is rupturing at that monorail transition. So you, you can't tell initially on fluoroscopy, you only see the two dots of the balloon, but you actually don't realize it's actually 30 you know, centimeters back. And so if you have a balloon pin strategy or a trap liner, then you can actually take advantage of that and just empirically pin and you just pull the whole guide out yes. as one piece. But recognizing that you, you actually really, you know, you have the second, you'd actually examine the part that came out. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that's really important is to not assume that it snapped at the balloon tip. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And any, any questions from the audience? All right, have a good evening. I, th I think it was a great session. Thank you so much for, and don't forget, uh, 8, 5.30, uh, the 38th floor reception. Faculty and uh, audience.